I will talk about, as Eric mentioned, about neuromarketing. I'm going to give a few different studies and uh, some examples of what we do just to illustrate kind of the breadth of the type of problems that we study. Um, I think if you just see this title, you might think like, you know, we're going to go in like, you know, zap people's brains and make them do things like that, that we want, uh, like rats, right? But uh, of course, you know, if you're, if you're a good marketer, you want to kind of think in customer-centric ways, and that's not exactly, uh, to get people to buy what you want them to buy isn't a particularly customer-centric view of the world. So, um, but even, even if that's the case, there's still plenty of things we can learn and that we can uh, uh, leverage from kind of these insights. And so I'll try to show kind of with, with three Three, um, three and a half studies, you know, just kind of some of the, some of the ways that um, these types of technology can advance uh, the frontiers of marketing. And uh, this is also something that's, uh, you know, very few schools. There's like, you know, Berkeley. Um, uh, I'm at Berkeley. There's another faculty at um, Kellogg, at Wharton. So, you know, there, there's a few of us in, in, this, uh, in this area. Uh, we're a bit of a luxury good. So if you, you know, if you're like, uh, you know, top tier uh, business schools, there, there, there are quite a few of us. And once you go kind of a little bit lower ranks, like it's, it's hard to afford people like us. So I'm very, I'm very grateful to have a job to be here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and I think like a lot of academic research and thinking about like what the value of academic research you know it's like it's not you know things that we might do in one or two years it's really I think changing you know it's like all of us kind of have sort of think like we have a lottery ticket where in maybe 10 20 years we might you know change the world or at least contributing to changing the world in terms of how people think about you know marketing businesses um, and, and, and the brain as well. So, um, so first, maybe a little bit about me, um, and thanks, Eric, for the wonderful introduction. So I uh, am the William Halford Jr. Chair in Marketing. For those of you who recognize that, uh, that, that was uh, Tech Ho's um, uh, chair for a long time. So it's, uh, it's, it's a big shoes to uh, fill in now that he's uh, uh, he's a uh, vice president in the uh, in U.S. Um, and uh, my background, like a lot of people in marketing, my background is uh, outside of marketing in economics from Caltech. And, um, and hopefully you can kind of see where kind of my knowledge of economics and uh, neuroscience is going to contribute to how I think of uh, uh, marketing. And, uh, you know, as outsiders, I think, you know, there's some disadvantages, but I think one of the advantages is we kind of bring some new perspectives to, um, uh, to these um, classic questions. I've been at Haas uh, since 2009. It is kind of shocking every time I see on LinkedIn, I think I mentioned a few of you, like, oh, it's like 12, 13 year anniversary. It's like, oh my God, what happened? Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm the director of the Berkeley Neuroeconomics Lab. Um, during better days, uh, the, you know, there's uh, all of us at, uh, at actual physical gathering. We're hoping to have another one of these. And uh, on top are some of our collaborators, including I think some that, uh, uh, at least one that uh, hopefully many of you would notice, Leif Nelson, who, um, uh, who is also faculty here. And um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about kind of understanding cons the mind of the consumers with the aid of kind of biological, by not, not just asking people questions or looking at what they do, but also by directly looking into their brains and seeing what they're thinking about. Right? And uh, this is something that marketers have had really long-standing interest, not so much in terms of the brain, although even back like 100 years ago, you can find people talking about like, oh, we can you know, look into people's brains and like control them like a robot, stuff like that, very kind of sci-fi. But, uh, but, but I think sort of the mind and consumer mindsets, many of you, you know, especially those of you who um, uh, got your uh, uh, MBAs um, you know, a, little bit, a little bit of time ago, this uh, example, might, that you might even had this case, uh, the new Coke case, which is very popular. Uh, I think some, uh, there's some people who still use this case. And it's still a classic. And this is one of the quotes from that case. Um, uh, and uh, it's sort of a fairly popular you know, um, uh, quote. So this is about the new Coke debacle. And Don Keogh, who is the CEO at the time, talks about you know, why they couldn't foresee 
the failure of New Coke, and he talks about all the time and skills um, poured into consumer research on New Coke, could not measure the, and reveal the deep and abiding emotional attachment people had to the classic Coke, right? And, uh, and then he continues, you know, and you cannot measure it any more than you can measure love, pride, or patriotism. <laughs> right, so, so, and I think this is, um, I think what a lot of um, uh, marketers and business uh, people think about when they think about kind of these really deep-seated um, uh, um, kind of associations and mindsets, that these are like really intangible and hard to measure. Right? And that's, I think, one of the things that we want to take that's, that seems very fuzzy and soft and convert it to something that's much more tangible and real, um, or, or at least scientifically testable. So... That's just kind of one you know, high-level view. And then the three types of questions I, I'm hoping to give you a taste of in terms of what we and many other people are working on is, so I'm going to start out with just asking kind of, I think, a question that mar a lot of marketers should be asking themselves, but they oftentimes don't, um, which is, how do we really know what we know? Right? Like, we think people are having these thoughts about patriotism, they love Coke, et cetera. How do we really know? And, uh, and without confronting that question seriously, it ends up being, there ends up being a lot of skepticism, especially for those who are kind of more quantitatively minded, who want, are kind of kind of hard-nosed like finance accounting types. It ends up being very dissatisfied when, you know, we, we can't answer this question very precisely. Um, whoops. What happened? Okay. And second is, now once we know about these associations, once we know about what's going on in people's minds, how do we know that any of this really matters? How do we tie it to things that we really care about in terms of sales, in terms of loyalty and revenue and profits? Right? And lastly, which I think is something that is at the forefront of one of the areas where we're really uh, making, I think, great advances, is probably the hardest question is not just like what do we think what are we thinking in terms of very discrete types of uh, uh, associations or like what do you think about a brand, but really like what we are experiencing at a moment, right? Are you listening to this talk? How do I know what you're experiencing, how different what one person's experience is versus another person's experience? How do I kind of tailor the experience to better fit their needs, to appeal to them more, to persuade them more, right? And these are, you know, experiences are incredibly complicated because, they are, you know, I'll talk more about this. They are temporally extended. People have very poor insight. If I, if I ask you, you know, an hour from now, describe what was going on through your mind when you were listening to this talk, right? You might give, like, snippets here and there. You might remember some stuff. But it's going to be very difficult to kind of give a very temporally rich profile, right? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, none of us, I think, are particularly good at doing that. And that makes it really challenging for marketers who often depend on kind of very small touch points. So either a survey or I'll measure your behavior. So you're missing kind of all this really rich and important details. So we're going to try to make some advances there as well. So first, let me just ask you, let me just talk about the first question, which is, I think um, uh, many of you probably have, uh, if you've taken a brand management class, certainly if you've taken a marketing research class, you would have talked about some of these concepts. So when marketers ask questions like, you know, what do people think of when they see, for example, a brand, right? So what they might do is they might give you a brand, like Dr. Pepper. They might ask, uh, ask you either an open-ended question or they might ask you to fill out a survey. And people say things like, you know, when I see a Dr. Pepper, I think, you know, it's like non-conforming, fun, interesting, exciting, offbeat, right? It's like, okay, I don't know. It's like, does that seem reasonable? I think like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> like you say, five, four, like one, I don't think this, I don't think it's interesting, right? Um, or say Pepto-Bismol, uh, many people say it's kind, warm, caring, right? So, so none of these things seem crazy, but also, None of these things really, if I told you that people really don't think in that way when I show them the brand Pepto-Bismol, I don't think you'd be 
I don't know. If you were to bet like $100 on like, do people really think these thoughts? I don't know if you put like, I don't know what type of odds you give me, but I don't think you'd be like, you know, you say, oh, I am like, I don't think people are thinking that at all. Or, you know, I, I think people are definitely thinking these thoughts, right? And, um, and uh, that's exactly what, um, so that range is exactly what you see in the real world as well, in that there are kind of skeptics who look at these and go, marketers, bunch of crazy people, they're, they're like just, they're, they, they just, you know, they tell you, they tell you some, uh, this stuff because, I don't know, they have a marketing budget they need, need to fill, and uh, this is a McKinsey article that literally says this, right, like, marketing, you know, they, we're going to give them some amount of money, they're going to do whatever they do, and we're just going to hope that it generates demand, right? <laughs> it's like, and, and if you're a marketer, it's like, oh, that's, that's pretty depressing, like, so... <laughs> Like, I don't think, uh, that, that, is not a, that is not a very, um, uh, 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 that is certainly not good for the ego. And I think more importantly, if you are the CEO or if you're an investor, it's like, how should I be looking at marketing, uh, uh, marketing investment? <clears throat> if I don't really know, <clears throat> if I can't really trust what they're, what they're measuring, and if I can't trust what they're trying to influence, right? So the question is, are people really thinking about, or at least the first question, before we even get to how does that actually affect their behavior, is are your assertions about what they're thinking of inside what I'm trying to influence with advertising and brand building exercises, are those even real? Right? How do we even know that um, uh, people think about brands the way marketers believe? So if you ask people to take it on faith, well, I teach marketing research, um, um, and um, you know I, have a, I, I give one of the cases or one of the readings I always give students is a reading called decision-based evidence making. Right? All of you know evidence-based decision making, but decision-based evidence making is also very popular in the real world, and that's exactly what oftentimes marketers ask for, of um, uh, of their. Um, of the folks who are controlling the purse strings. Like, okay, here's a decision that I want to make. Here's your evidence. Can you, you know, let, let me do it, right? Like, that's not a very healthy way of uh, operating. So, and, and so this is, uh, this is a study that we did a few years back where we kind of tried to take a first step towards this question. And I think once you can, and so I, hopefully this is, you, you can get an intuition pretty quickly where if I can now look into your brain I can see some correlate of your thoughts. Now it's possible that I can see what you're thinking without even asking you the question. Right? So because so much of what marketers, I think the skepticism about what marketers um, are, are, are the, the data and the evidence that marketers are generating is I ask you the question and you tell me the answer. Right? And as any lawyer, as any marketer knows, how you ask the question matters a lot for the type of answers that you get. Like if I'm really good at my job, I can kind of ask a question that will maximize the chances that I'll get what I want in return, right? So by looking in the brain directly, we can now also do this. So we can still ask them questions, but we can ask them the questions either in a completely different group of people or ask them the questions after they have you know, seen and thought about the brand, right? So in the way that there is no experimenter uh, demand effects right, on the consumers. So people's brain activities should be sufficient to tell us what brand they are thinking about if they really are thinking about those brands. Like if I show you Pepto-Bismol, you really are thinking of them, uh, thinking of it like you know, it's, it's um, caring and it's soothing, et cetera, right? Or if it's not, then you shouldn't see anything there. They're just thinking about like, well, I don't know, the last time I had an obsessed stomach and I needed pepto bismol, right? Which is completely possible. So this is uh, so so this was a, a study with uh, Leif Nelson, 
and uh, our former PhD student, Yu Ping Chen, who is now in uh, National Taiwan University. And uh, so we put people into an fMRI scanner. So that's one of the machines. Um, uh, it's not exactly the one from, uh, uh, from Berkeley, but this one's looked better. So I stole that from the internet. Um, and we gave people probably the, the most boring experiment I've ever done. Like we literally just gave people and, and, and told them to look at these logos. Right? It's like, see, why is it, uh, here's LV. Um, Coke, IBM, every once in a while we make sure you didn't fall asleep and you press a button and you move on and I show you Google, right? And it's like, that's all we ask. And then we say, when you see the brand, just think about it. Just, you know, just think about it as if you're a regular consumer. We tell you absolutely nothing more than that. We just tell you to think about it, right? So, so, so in fact, we could have done this as a double-blind experiment. Like, experimenter didn't know, the, didn't know what we were trying to study, and the subject didn't know what we were trying to ask, right? So, so I mean, it was just single-blind because, you know, it's like, I don't think it was, I don't think we're giving anything away. And, it's not, like a, it's not like the random uh, consumer that we got from Berkeley community is going to know about, say, the brand personality scale that we're going to give them later on. Right? Like, if you haven't taken a marketing class, like, you know, all this stuff is going to be completely uh, bizarre. So, okay. So I'll, I'll try to walk through this very quickly. So this is um, kind of the study. So um, we took kind of 44 you know, pretty well-known brands. The, the method is, uh, those of you who are taking marketing research won't find this, uh, or analytics won't find this surprising. We took, we trained um, uh, how, uh, how the brain responded to various aspects of what's called brand personality, which I'll show you the framework later. Um, but it's basically, you know, five factors like human personality that's been developed actually by Jennifer Ocker, um, who is at Haas' um, uh, daughter, Dave Ocker. And, um, and then once we learn how people think about brand personality in these 42 brands, we can take the two holdout brands and we can say, we can ask, can we see, can we predict whether someone was thinking about um, Walt Disney or Gucci in the scanner without actually knowing what, um, uh, without knowing which um, uh, uh, brand they were thinking about. Right? So if, we, if the brain actually is holding kind of these associations in the way that uh, marketers think, then it should be pretty obvious that Disney is nothing like Gucci. The logos are actually not that different. They're all kind of black and white. You know, there's like blob, um, and which, we can, you know, which we can control for. But, um, so if we can tell the difference between them, then, you know, they were actually probably thinking about things associated with brand personality of Disney or the brand personality of Gucci. Right. So, so, so that this is exactly what we did. So, from these 42 brands, we were able to. So, then we generate maps of um, of what each of these dimensions. So, the dimensions go. And these are like when I first did this, it's like really. It's like this is what marketers think, or this is what consumers think. Like exciting. Uh, so, for example, Apple. And, uh, and, and Google are exciting. McDonald's is not exciting. Um, uh, JP Morgan is competent. Uh, I forget who, all these are pretty competent. Marlboro is not competent. Uh, sincere. Uh, this one, Campbell's, has been the most sincere brand since the, uh, when, when Jennifer developed the scale in the, 19, uh, in the 90s. Campbell's was the most sincere brand. And we did this test in 2015, and Campbell's was still the most sincere brand. That's probably the one that didn't move, that, that retained their brand equity throughout the, the 20 years. It's kind of amazing. So you can kind of, kind of get these um, um, personality dimensions, and these are, you know, the, the, it's sort of a hodgepodge of different regions, right? You can sort of imagine that these are, it's not like, it's not like a visual, it's not like the visual system or the motor system where it's like very localized. These are like very distributed representations. So then what we can do is we can take these maps and then we can use them to form predictions of if you are looking at Disney, this is the, um, this is the um, uh, brain image that we should be seeing. And this is, if it's Gucci, and we actually see this, and if that's the case, which one is closer? Right. So you can actually predict which one do we think they are looking at purely based on what we know about these guys. 
And you know, the good news is, well, I probably wouldn't be presenting this if it didn't work at all. Um, but yes, actually, the self-report and the neural measures actually do line up pretty well. So if you look at the brands that are very distinct, they are very easy to discriminate. The brands that are very similar, they were basically at chance. And if you look at the brain, uh, so this is the brain on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the correlation of these attributes, of these dimensions. Uh, in terms of their uh, um, personality, uh, of their self-report ratings. Right? So you can kind of see that there is a pretty good relationship, pretty strong relationship. So for example, Nestle and Marlboro, about as polar opposite as it gets. So those are negatively correlated in people's self-report. And in the brain, they are also very highly negatively correlated. Whereas H&M and MTV, which are very different in terms of you know, observable characteristics, right? like one's in apparel and the other one's in entertainment, they are, in terms of personality, they are very similar. And they are also very similar in the brain. Right? So, that's, um, so that's kind of one way that we can say, OK, what they're thinking about of course, you know, people can think about different things, and it's not like they're always thinking about you know, these personality dimensions. There's you know, things that are related to you know, when their last usage, you know, when they were a kid, et cetera. But overall, it's clearly not that marketers are just making up stuff, which is kind of the very cynical view of marketers is about. Okay? So that brings up the question of now if we really do believe that marketers are giving you something that's uh, uh, in the, that, that's measuring something that's in the mind of the consumer, is it actually something that I should care about as a business person, right? So or is it, is it going to affect my choices, for example, right? Is it, if, I, if I spend a million dollars on a brand building exercise and I go from like a, since, uh, a, you know, a very insincere brand to a very sincere brand, right? I mean, that's probably a little bit too much to ask for. But suppose that, you know, I move the dial in whatever amount. Is that going to affect the thing that I really care about? And uh, that's also something that marketers have a very optimistic answer for, which is, you know, and I think it makes, I think all of us kind of have this intuitive sense that having a rich set of associations with a brand or a product is really important for something that we all think of as really important for consumer purchases, which is top of mind awareness. Right? And uh, so, you know, so there's whole books. If you go to the airport, there are lots of books about these topics. And uh, Geico, I saw this example from Eric. Um, Geico you know, was the first uh, uh, insurance company that had anything other than, I don't know, a beige box in terms of, uh, in terms of their branding, right? So, and they have been incredibly successful in what's name an insurance company. Oh, Geico, why? Because Everything else is like just, you know, I don't know, blank, right? It's like State Farm or whatever. Well, now they're actually pretty good. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, the underlying assumption for all of these is that the top of mind awareness is one of the important goals for advertising and brand management. Right? Like, I think all of you, well, and I don't say all of you, many of you accept this, that if, you're, if you are trying to, uh, if you're doing brand management, if you're trying to do advertising, yeah, that, that, that's a, you know, you care about sales, but you also care about achieving top of mind. Well, if you ask um, a skeptic, they would say, and this is a, a marketing, this is something that probably, I don't know how many of you heard about this, Marketing Accountability Standards Board. It's basically like it, it's a skeptic society. I don't know if you heard of them. It's like the skeptic society for marketing. And they're basically very, I mean, I think it's great that, they're, that they are doing what they're doing. So because they keep people accountable. So one of the things that they said, I'm paraphrasing because I couldn't find a very pithy quote. Uh, the value of top of mind awareness basically should be measured by the brand price premium. Like, if I'm successful, I should get people to pay more for a brand. And that also seems kind of reasonable. Right? It's like, yeah, like where else are you gonna, how else are you gonna get people to buy more, right? Or pay, pay more for your, for your brand. Um, uh, but if you do that, it's kind of depressing. So this is one, uh, I was hoping, I don't think I see um, uh, uh, Ronnie or Mayank or Srini or Harish here, but uh, this was a, a project that, uh, um, uh, so this was an e evening MBA class, and uh, this was a, uh, basically a USB stick device company that, you know, all of you would know. 
Right, so, so this is probably the, one of the first things, one of the top of mind companies. Uh, I blurred it out um, just, uh, just for, uh, since I know this is recorded. And, uh, and uh, we did a conjoint study. We did a conjoint study for how do we get people to, or how do we design the optimal bundle of features for consumers when it comes to these uh, over the, over the, uh, or on the go devices, basically USB, fancy way of saying USB stick. And uh, I don't know how many of you remember from your class, uh, not going to quiz you, I promise, uh, how do you run a, a conjoint study? But you might remember that at the end of the day, you get from conjoint study kind of these, uh, these part worth measures. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> part worth measures for each of the attributes like memory size, price, and the bigger it is, the, the higher it is, the more important that feature is for the consumer. So you can see like memory, price, wireless connectivity, all those things are really important. And now look at where brand is, right? Brand is basically nothing. It, it, it's statistically insignificant in terms of how much it affects their, their uh, uh, people's utility. And this is one of the top um, brands in the market when it comes to USB sticks. Now, this is very common. If you do a conjoint study and you measure brand premium, it is incredibly depressing with the exception of like lifestyle brands and luxury goods. Like people will pay more for Beats, people will pay more for Apple, but if you ask like for most other functional goods, people won't pay more for any of that, right? Like it's very tiny, one or two percent. And then, and then you're saying like, okay, like if that's all they care about, like why am I spending all this money, right? So I think there's good reason. And in fact, I don't know, all of you, and I'm not gonna give any refunds because uh, it's, it's not my place, but I think we've been, taught, we've been teaching students this. I still teach this. It's a really valuable tool, but I think it probably underestimates the value of a brand for consumer decision-making by orders of magnitudes, right? because we're actually missing something very fundamental. Um, and uh, what's missing is, um, I think one way to think about this is, what's missing is um, we've all drank the standard economic model Kool-Aid, and it's making us blind to something really fundamental, which is the way that a conjoint study works, the way that most econometric models of that, uh, that tries to estimate brand premium works is, we assume that people are making choices where almost all the relevant information is at their disposal. Right? It's like it's, it's in front of you. So the way you do a conjoint study is you like literally give a, uh, a product profile to them and you say, do you want it or not? Yes, I want it. No, I don't want it. Or like, yes, it's 10 points, it's nine points, whatever. Right? Like, that is really valuable, but that actually overlooks some really important things. So one of them is, it looks like basically saying, do you want apples or do you want oranges, right? Like, you know. Whereas I think in a lot of real life decisions, I don't tell you there's an apple, I don't tell you there's an orange, you have to think of it, right? It's like, ah, oh, what fruit would you like to have, right? Like, where would you like to go for lunch? You can look on Yelp, right? But ultimately, you have to decide to look on Yelp. It's like, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'll just go to whatever, you know, the canteen nearby, right? Like that's, people say that all the time. And this, the important thing is that this is almost, if you remember from your, uh, uh, your, your uh, core micro econ class or any of the econ classes, this is the view of the world, that humans go through life as if they have menus in front of them, exhaustive menus in front of them. But obviously that's not correct, right? Like people go through and they have to think about what do I want? Do I even want this? Do I even want that, right? Like need recognition is completely outside of this, of this standard model, right? And once you, once you take account of that, you actually see huge differences in terms of the, uh, the, the, the effect of the brand. So this is kind of the workhorse. So this is another study. So this is the workhorse model or the, the uh, studies or experimental paradigm. So on the left, you have things that we call memory-based choices, where we say, you know, give us your preferred fruit, right? On the right-hand side, we give you something like a conjoint study, and you can choose from a menu. So on the left, you say, like, ah, eh, sorry, sure, apple, why not? I can't think of anything. And on the left, you're like, the apple, there's banana. It's like, oh, guava. I didn't think of guava, so now I choose guava, right? Like, that's, that, is, that is incredibly intuitive for humans, and yet, it is outside of the scope of the standard models. Right? The standard model says you have everything in front of you. 
And if you don't think of it, yeah, it's probably because you don't like it. You know, you, don't, you can't think of guava, yeah, you probably didn't like guava in the first place. Human memory doesn't work that way. Right? So this is, uh, uh, and what I'll show you, the data is our first study, and that's when we kind of realized both that we were really onto something, and also, I can't believe no one has looked at this before. So this is fast food. If you look at uh, people's choices of fast food, and I look at the difference between the memory-based choice and uh, what we call the stimulus-based choice, basically when you get a menu, and you look at the difference between the two, these are choice shares. So these are not percentages. So this is 15%. You can see McDonald's here. McDonald's gains 15% in choice shares when we move from when we uh, move from a world where you have a menu to a world where you don't have a menu. And keep in mind, McDonald's choice share is only 30% in the world without a menu. So 50%, uh, so, so their, their demand drops 50% when you give people a menu, right, like that. That is the value of the, all the advertising from probably when we were born to now, right? Like the cumulative effect of that is when you think of McDonald's, I don't think I like McDonald's that much, but if I think of fast food, yeah, McDonald's is gonna be the first thing I think of. And that makes a gigantic difference. And you can see all the ones that benefit, Burger King, Wendy's, et cetera. All of those things are ones that are top of mind and Chick-fil-A, In-N-Out, Subway, Popeyes, right? Like those are ones that hurt when you don't have a menu. Those are all ones with lower, um, uh, um, lower top of mind. Chick-fil-A, funnily enough, uh, has really moved up in the last three years. Like now it's like somewhere around here, I would say top of the, top of, uh, top of the uh, pack here, uh, right behind kind of the traditional giants. Um, so they've been very successful. And if you look at running shoes, it's, the same, it's a similar story, except here, Nike is the 600 pound gorilla. Right? Like everyone knows Nike, and people for the most part like Nike, but also, but still, Nike loses about 20% of the choice shares when you present them with a menu. I mean, those are gigantic, gigantic effects. Those are not like, you know, 1% is not statistically significant, right? That we see from the brand premium. Um, and, uh, and so this was a study that we published last year in the Proceedings National Academy of Science. And uh, the model is something that actually came out of marketing from the 1980s. So the idea, I think, is very intuitive, which is people kind of have kind of different stages of decision making. Just think of like your consumer journey. So you first have to be aware of something, then you have to retrieve it, and then, and then you know, compare it, and then finally you choose it, right? So the first part is kind of memory retrieval. How, do you, how likely are you to even consider that item? And once you, once you added stuff into your consideration set, you might say like, ah, how, do I, how much do I like that? How much do I like this? And then you might choose it. And uh, with the neuroscience, I won't talk too much about how we know, but this is kind of the, uh, one of the axioms that we sort of developed from the neuroscience of memory and valuation, which is these are two systems in the brain that are kind of operating independently. So for example, you can have a rat and you can lesion, and these are kind of terrible experiments, but you can sort of lesion the rat's memory system and they can still go around fine, you know, making the, as long as they can see a menu in front of them, for example, you know, whatever menu is for a rat, they can go around and they can do perfectly fine, like, you know, valuing things. Or you can, um, uh, but you know, their memory is completely shot. Or you can lesion the part that's responsible for value, and now they know where to go, but their choices are like all over the place, right? So these are like independent systems that are interacting kind of at the moment of choice. Like you're, you're kind of constructing these consideration sets on the go. And so then what we can do is that once we have a model of memory, so I'll skip all the details there, uh, and then once you have preference, we just need to multiply those two things together to, get a, 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 to make a very precise prediction of how much, how likely people are to choose a item when, they're, when they don't have a menu, right? When they have to construct these uh, choice sets themselves. And, uh, and so this is from a, a, a computational model of human memory um, because it's you know, a little bit too much work to actually like scan everyone and extract their memory network. I mean, we can do that and we're actually doing that right now, but um, 
it's much faster if you just ask a computer to do it from, their, uh, uh, from, from uh, other data. So what we're trying to do is to kind of construct these, what's called associative memory networks. So if you say like, what fruit would you like to have? You might say like, oh, apple, banana, orange, and then you have like a cluster here, for example, of like tropical fruits, right? Like tropical fruits. Once I think of pineapple, I also think of mango, coconut, and, uh, and papaya, for example, right? So that's kind of the idea, that things that are associated with each other are, um, are, are more accessible. And that's sort of also the, the, the baseline idea for um, models of um, uh, top of mind awareness. Like why do marketers care about kind of setting associations and top of mind awareness because of this. Right? Um, because when you think fast food, you immediately think McDonald's, right? And that's gonna make it into your consideration set. And so once we do that, then we can create these networks, and, uh, and they're a little bit messy, but I'll just, I'll just kind of go through one, one, uh, a few examples. So when people first think, when people first choose uh, uh, and choose, say, a running shoe, they overwhelmingly go to Nike, okay? So they go to Nike, and then they, uh, and, uh, and, but um, the last item, so when they say, ah, I run out of things, right? When they fail to retrieve, that, can, that gets contribution for many, many different brands, okay? So from Nike, they go to Adidas. Uh, sometimes they go to New Balance. And by the time you get to Brooks, you kind of run out of things to retrieve. Like, I didn't even know Brooks was a running shoe when I started the project. But uh, every, every single person who thought about Brooks failed to retrieve any additional brand, Right. So there's a, lot of very, there's a lot of regularity in how human memory works, and that's what we're going to exploit. So what we're going to do is, um, there's lots of details that I'd be happy to uh, flush you out uh, afterwards and send you the paper, et cetera, afterwards. But just, let me just give you the high-level takeaway, which is if we just take the standard economic model approach to this and we say preferences are, is governing your behavior, you get a pretty good prediction of how they will do in the memory-based choices. It's not crazy, right? Like people have been using these models for decades because for the most part, they actually kind of work. So the R square is 0.46. If you're dealing with choice data, 0.46 is pretty damn good. Right? Most, most of these choice models, you know, you're not gonna do much better than that. Now, if I only use a memory-only model, and I skip the details there, but just trust me, like this one is only using how likely are you to uh, retrieve the item. So this would be like a naive marketer's model where choices are just proportional to how frequently you, gener you select that uh, brand. That one does much better. So that one is 0.8. So you might think like, ah, marketers win, right? Well, if you put those two things together, you get something that at least the first time I look at it, and uh, if I saw a student present this, I say, you should go back and look at the data, because clearly you made a mistake, uh, because when in the real world do you ever get an R squared of 0.94, right? Like, it's just not, it's not possible. So we checked multiple times, and we ran this, and we ran it for multiple categories, and it really is, once you put those two things together, you get an incredibly accurate and precise estimate of what people actually do, because memory and preference both contribute to their choices in a very specific way. Right? And now we can also look at um, uh, running shoes. Now running shoes is funny because running shoes, um, marketers are the naive marketing model is pretty bad and the naive economist model is pretty good. But when you put them together, it's even more amazing. The R square is 0.99, can't do any better than that. Uh, and more, moreover, you can kind of look at all the different categories that we put into, uh, uh, so there's fish, salad dressing, green vegetables, fresh fruits, uh, uh, and uh, fish. Um, yeah, and uh, did I say fish already? Or oh, in running shoes. Um, fish is kind of an interesting one. Uh, Americans apparently only know fish, uh, only know salmon, uh, and only like salmon. So. <laughs> It's, uh, but I think it's also a, another one where you can kind of see the, uh, the, the drive to have more sustainable fish. If you're thinking about like, should, I, should we lower the price for these fish, uh, for the sustainable fish uh, species? Well, actually, American consumers don't even know what they are. Like, you should probably at least educate them on what they are, you know, all the basic stuff before you start playing around with prices because it's probably much more expensive to have to pay them 
to eat more sustainable fish when, uh, as opposed to you know, educating them. Right? Um, and uh, you can also take this to the real world. This is the fast food data, the fast food sales data for um, uh, in the US in 2019, I think. And uh, you can see the standard model. So this is a standard model using just preferences. And you can also see that this model underappreciates how big of a contribution, why does it do this all the time? Uh, the, the contribution of, um, of the McDonald's, of the McDonald's uh, brand for their sales. And once you take it into account, the memory effect, it is a much better uh, prediction of their brand equity here. And same thing with, um, with running shoes. Although running shoes, it's already pretty good. So actually the, the parts where it's better are like things like New Balance uh, and Skechers. Um, so not Nike, because for the most part, people know Nike and people like Nike. Uh, that's another, I think, really interesting thing with uh, uh, aspect that we're fleshing out, trying to flesh out with kind of the, the once you include top of mind awareness into the competitive dynamics, now you're kind of competing on two fronts, right? You're competing on memory and you're competing on preference. Now, if you're great on both, that's awesome. But if you slip on one but not the other, sometimes the effect can be masked temporarily, kind of like with McDonald's, right? Like people don't actually like McDonald's very much. And um, so and it's being sort of propped up by all this association. But once the association goes, McDonald's is gonna drop very quickly. Right, so, so, and that, that's, that's something that you can kind of imagine that <clears throat> marketers, uh, that the marketing accountability uh, folks sort of probably are overlooking that if you just say sales are great, why don't we cut back on ad spending? We, we don't have to invest in our, um, in our brand building. And uh, after a while, you know, people don't remember McDonald's as, uh, as well anymore. And then you see sales kind of crashing very quickly. You're like, oh, what happens? Like, well, it's like, that was the only thing that was propping you up. Um, uh, but now if I spend more, well, that's a part that we're actively doing research on right now, which is as opposed to price, um, actually all of you I think intuitively know this, if you take a pricing class, prices work really quickly, right? If I lower prices, demand's gonna go up very quickly. If I, if I uh, um, uh, increase prices, demand's gonna go down very quickly. Memory doesn't work like that. It takes years, sometimes decades to build up any sort of strong association. So if you stop investing for a while, it's not like you can just like spigot that you can turn on and off very quickly. And the temporal dynamics of these different systems are something that I don't think anyone is really seriously uh, um, um, thought about and certainly not in terms of measuring. Okay, and so lastly, I want to just go over really quickly to something that I think is probably the most, I would say, exciting part, one of the most exciting parts of our, our research, which is measuring experiences. And this is also a, a piece of work that's sort of in progress, because I thought like it's you know, useful to also see not just the, the work that we've already done, but also the stuff that might be coming out a year, two years, you know, however later, and kind of get you, you know, a little bit behind the scenes look in terms of um, you know, how, how these studies actually, how the sausage is actually made. Right. So uh, in this case, we're looking at human experience. So I already mentioned that um, um, experiences are hard to measure and uh, it's hard to articulate. And so as opposed to like brand personality, I can't just go around like during this talk, imagine if there's someone, I don't know, imagine if you had like an iPad or something in front of you and like every five seconds it's telling you like, oh, how are you feeling, how are you feeling, how are you feeling, right? Like that would kind of destroy your kind of flow um, I, was, I would say appreciation, but I don't, wanna, I don't want to uh, uh, speculate too much of, uh, of your talk. So measuring experiences are really challenging because you're probably requiring someone to retrospect uh, onto something that happened hours, maybe days, maybe months earlier. Like that is really, really tough. So this one, I don't think marketers really uh, overstate because they appreciate the difficulty of measuring consumer experiences. And uh, this is not a, just a problem for marketers, but also for the courts. So we're gonna actually focus on the courts because, I don't know, it's kind of more fun and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the problem is, uh, if anything, more tangible and directly actionable. But uh, it's still you know, sort of marketing, business and law, the intersection. So, uh, so, this is, so if you've been following the news at all, 
you have heard about uh, over the past few years, uh, blur lines. Robin Thicke and Pharrell was uh, sued for plagiarizing from uh, uh, Marvin Gaye and Gotta Give It Up. And they just, uh, in the, I think it was uh, last year or this year, they've lost their final appeal and they really are on the hook for $5 million for the Marvin Gaye estate form plagiarizing. So this case has sort of opened up a Pandora's box of lawsuits. Um, this one I tell my undergrads to make them feel I'm cool. So this is Dua Lipa that got uh, sued for copyright infringement and lots of an S. Sheeran, lots of them have been, have been sued in the last few years exactly because of this. And in trademark law, this is also a problem where you deal with, um, you deal with uh, uh, trademark uh, infringement. So we actually have a patent on this uh, or pending on this uh, from, from some of this work that I'm gonna build on, but it's basically, if I look at Reese's and I look at like Toffee Crisp, and this was a real lawsuit. Um, Reese's sued Toffee Crisp because they thought Toffee Crisp was coming from England, which is too close to Reese's, and they won, right? They actually won the lawsuit. And you look at like, they're not really that close together. But that's kind of the whole point that uh, the law depends on for, for, at least in the American system, the, the, the um, criteria for whether you have infringed on someone's trademark or copyright is basically 12 jurors sitting around like deciding like, yeah, do these things kind of look close? Yeah, sure, why not? Right? Like, I, you, you laugh, but like, that's exactly what that is. So we have a lawyer, uh, we, have a, we have a law professor who's working with us and, uh, and who, who, who wrote a, a law review about this and it's like, you know, what's, how bad is it when you have no uh, objective standard. One is, I uh, get really bad puns, so there's like, you know, blur lines surrounding copyright infringement. Um, and also, you get, these are from prominent judges and law, legal scholars, like the copyright law. It makes no sense. It's notoriously confusing and confused. It's a virtual black hole in jurisprudence. Like, literally everyone's in it happy. Like, even the lawyers. You would think, like, lawyers would love this because there's more lawsuits. But I think they're not happy about this either because it is so, uh, it's, it's very much like what marketers deal with. It is so idiosyncratic. Uh, there, there's not any predictability in terms of whether, you're, um, whether your case is going to, whether you're going to win or your case. So it's not about your ability. It's about, like, you're just buying a lottery. Like, why, you know, why? I, I can imagine from their professional sensibilities, like, why, why am I doing this, right? This, I'm not adding any value to this case. And, uh, and, and the general problem is that these cases, just like what we talked about, if you're dealing with kind of consumer mindsets and you don't trust the data, so they have survey data, they have expert data, but they don't trust any of it, right? For very much the same reason that we mentioned earlier, because lawyers, like marketers, can lie, right? And they have millions of dollars on the line, why wouldn't they lie? Uh, so I, I'm gonna throw out everything, I'm just gonna let the jury decide. So, it's really not a fact-based discussion anymore. And, uh, and, and because it's not a fact-based discussion, you end up with stuff like this. Do you make this. it a habit of being dishonest when you give interviews? So this is Robin um, Thicke. When I, do, when I give interviews, I tell whatever I want to say to help sell records. So with, he was, with, with all due respect, I was uh, high and drunk every time I did an interview last year. And Mr. Thicke, I, I do have so to So this ask was you, his defense um, for, you, I didn't steal those lyrics, play, or the, those elements. VH1, were you yeah. drunk and on Vicodin? I was, I, I I didn't do a single interview last year without uh, being high on both. Okay. Right, so, so, that, so that's what you're reduced to when you're dealing with these multi-million lawsuits with like really famous people, things that are shaping pop culture. It's like whether you're high on Vicodin or not, right? Like because, because he said at some point like, yeah, I took inspiration from Marvin Gaye and they're saying like, oh, that's, that's evidence that you, uh, you, know, that you uh, stole those, uh, those elements. And it's like, no, I was just, you know, I was just lying because you know, I, I didn't know what I was talking about, right? Because you can't verify anything from what anyone says. So you get these, you know, very bizarre, but very entertaining. Uh, you can just go on YouTube. Pharrell also, like, you know, was uh, interviewed. It's, it's very entertaining, but none of that has anything to do with facts, right? Or we have no idea what underlying facts are in these cases. So what we're going to do is we're hoping to be able to provide the first time that you can actually objectively quantify whether people are, in this case, kind of a very, very narrow um, uh, uh, goal. Um, whether two people's experiences are kind of similar or in some ways being affected by 
um, uh, by the allegedly infringing elements. Okay, so this is taking advantage of the idea that identical stimuli would evoke similar brain responses across people. If I hear the same thing as you, I, my brain will react in a similar way, and if I hear something very different from you, it will be very different, it will be more and more different from you. Okay? And uh, this is also a model that's been used to, uh, to measure uh, user engagement because the more engaging something is, the more similar our brains react to that because it's sort of capturing our attention in the same way as opposed to like us just, you know, uh, um, uh, us just, um, just sort of mind wandering around. So that, this has been something that was uh, developed and then we have something where um, we, we went to a football game and we put headsets on people to see like how they're enjoying or how they're engaged, uh, what's, engaging, uh, uh, what's engaging them during a football game, a, a live football event. But in this case, it's a much more controlled environment. Uh, one of the problems we found with a football game is like fans are too, too fidgety and they're like, they would jump up, right? It was like, oh, yay, you know, something happens. And we're like, oh, can you, can you like be, you know, stay, stay still because it's like going you know, to ruin our signal from our EEG caps. And they're like, and they're like oh, okay. And some of them are very nice and they're like, <laughs> you can just see them like trying to stop themselves like okay but so, so this is actually much much easier of study um, so what we're trying to do is the more different so the idea is the more different the study uh, the stimuli the more different our brains will be and so this was from the original study that that uh, developed this idea um, this is the good bad and the ugly and you can kind of see like five different people so this is 600 seconds of that movie and you can kind of see that people's brain activities are moving, you know, in synchrony to each other while they're watching the movie. And if you just have them watch, say, um, something like very random or like a blank screen, this correlation kind of goes away, right? So, so that's something that we can use to start quantifying whether two experiences are similar. Now, that's actually not enough. And this is, I think, the most fun part for me, at least, uh, as a scientist, because it's almost like we are making up, we're like, uh, like literally like completely making up like a new legal standards. Like we have these new, we have these, these new tools. How do we actually construct a setting where we can say something's infringing on something else? Right? Like no one has done that. So ah, let's just make it up. And literally the, the Zoom call went something like, it's like, oh, hey, it's like Mark. Mark is our uh, uh, law professor collaborator. Like, do you think this will work? And he thinks about it. It's like, oh yeah, I can see. Yeah, that, that, that sort of makes sense. And that, 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 that's where we are. I mean, and, and you know, no, no one has come up with this. No one has even thought about it. So, you know, it's, it's a good place to start at least. And uh, to give you a sense of why that measure wasn't enough and we need something more is um, just from a short snippet, for example, um, of the songs, it's, it's obvious that um, uh, uh, blur lines and Gotta Give Up are very different. Even if you take something that is kind of canonically um, uh, plagiarizing. So Vanilla Ice, you guys, uh, my undergrads, my undergrads actually still know Vanilla Ice amazingly. Like somehow he has made it. I, I, I don't, it, it's, it's, it's utterly insane, but he, he, has, he has survived in pop culture. Uh, um, and so he was sued. Many of you probably know this, remember this from firsthand experience, or have direct memories of this. He was sued for lifting the baseline from under pressure. Right. He, so he changed one note. He changed one note, and then he got sued. He ended up buying the rights to, uh, got, uh, to uh, Under Pressure. Uh, actually, uh, all the songs, or many of the songs from Queen, uh, because it was cheaper than settling the copyright lawsuit. So he just bought the song, and you know, you, then, then he has copyright of it. So this is a canonical example, which I'll show you some of those examples later. And, uh, but even there, if you just have two people listening, or someone listening to um, under Pressure and Ice Ice Baby, clearly they're two different songs, right? Like, it's as if you are, you know, if you, if you have a student who's like plagiarizing, right? Like every year there's somebody who's like kind of comes close, right? And uh, they might change some verbs, they might like lift like a paragraph, but you know, most of them are smart enough to not lift the whole thing. So if you look at the whole thing, then like, yeah, they're actually quite different. And so you can't even like, if you can't even say Vanilla Ice uh, stole from Queen, like you really can't do anything, right? Like that's about as close of an example as you get. So we actually need something more. We need something that is a more controlled experiment where we can ask the counterfactual 
that focuses on just the elements that are, um, that are allegedly infringing, right? And so, and so this actually required a lot more skills than any of us on the team had. So we did what, um, what the, everybody I, I imagine would do. Uh, we hired a music producer. <laughs> it's, uh, that it made for some interesting uh, uh, back and forth on the reimbursement uh, uh, um, uh, forms. Like, what did, what did, what did you do? You, you what? You're using research money to do what? Um, so this is our music producer and uh, Brandon Ruin. He's actually now uh, on, the, uh, on our paper because he was also very interested in, you know, I think a lot of musicians are emotionally invested in kind of um, uh, uh, in the cases of these outcomes because it's kind of attacking their originality and, um, and, 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 and scholarship, right? And this is, a, this is a research team. This is Mark, who is our legal scholar, and Femka, who uh, works on uh, um, uh, copyright law uh, in marketing. And uh, what we need to do is to be able to answer two questions, okay? So one how similar was the allegedly infringing elements to the original? This one's pretty easy. This one's pretty easy. We can just strip out those elements and play them, right? Like, and then see how similar they are. But this is by, this is much, this is the very minimal criteria. It's, this one is much harder. How important was that allegedly infringing element to the overall listening experience? So if you stole the baseline for under pressure, like, why did you steal that bass line? Well, because it's a really iconic bass line, and it really adds to the song. But if you just randomly took some other segment, that has, like, I can, like, you know, replace it with anything else. That was kind of the argument for, um, for the lawsuit about blur lines, that it's like you're copywriting a whole genre. It's like these are elements that you can find in any R&B song, and you're just putting, and you're suing me because you just happen to have that. Like, that doesn't feel right, right? And that's sort of the idea. Like, that, that element is not that important. It's sort of replaceable, right? It's like you want some things, like if you, I don't know, if you, for those of you who are into, like, uh, sports uh, uh, um, uh, uh, statistics, uh, analytics, it would be, like, the replacement value of that song segment, right? Like, that has to be very high for you to, I mean, it should be high for you to win the lawsuit because otherwise, you know, it's like uh, if something that is in happy birthday you like, and you say, like, oh, you copyrighted it, and, or you stole that, and it's also the same as uh, Happy Birthday. Like, that's not a, I don't, I don't, you know, I can't imagine that you contributed very much to the intellectual success or to the success of, of, um, of the song. And that was literally one of the arguments, like, one of the elements that the Marvin Gaye Estates was claiming was the, um, was uh, identical, was claiming that was infringing, was identical to um, the, the, the notes in Happy Birthday. Right. It, is, it is a really generic um, element in, the, in music in general. And yet they won, right? because it's like 12 people, and you're like, eh. So to do that, we need to be, and so this is where Brendan's skills came in. Uh, to do that, we need to be able to ask the counterfactual question. Right? So, so um, uh, you know, those of you who take an econ or, or your endless classes, like, what we want to ask are the counterfactual, because that gets us to the causes in terms of what if the allegedly infringing element was replaced with something else, right? Like, that, that's what we need. We need to be able to find the replacement value, and to have the replacement value, replacement value we need a control condition, okay? And so this is what we ended up doing, and uh, so, so if you kind of imagine you draw a line from identical to more and more dissimilar, right? So this is literally identical. So if I took the, if I took Ice Ice Baby and I compared, to, compared it to itself, that is literally identical and that is about as similar as it can possibly get, right? This is the highest similarity it can get, so that would be one of the baselines here, and for your enjoyment, and also it's gonna be important later on, this is what Ice Ice Baby sounds like. You probably haven't heard it in many years. <laughs> Okay, that's probably enough. <laughs> uh, uh, I've been listening to this song, and it's been driving my wife absolutely crazy. <laughs> it's like, all oh, that again. <laughs> okay, so now, if you have a second version, so now, in, uh, so this is, the, so this is uh, the version that if you replaced it with the actual under-pressure baseline, where would it be? 
So for the claim to be true, it should be very similar to the original song. So this is what happens if you took the under pressure baseline uh, and, 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 and literally put it into I Size Baby. I thought that I was gonna be able to do that and uh, after like an hour of playing around with like uh, 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 GarageBand, um, it was like, oh my God, like yeah. That, that's, why, that's why people have, th these people will always have a job because I, I have absolutely no interest in figuring any of that out. But this is what it sounds like from a professional music producer. I think it sounds better. <laughs> Let's kick it. Right, there's like one note that was slightly different, right? And, and but otherwise, if I didn't tell you, it could have just flown right by. You're listening to Vanilla Ice. Right? So that's one comparison, but that's not enough because that doesn't tell you how important it is. And so we added another song. So this is kind of the replacement value, right? So this is the control for, if we compare it to a different version that also had another bass line that's very listenable. And, uh, and so Brendan took the one from One Bites of Dust. And uh, I thought it was, a, it, it, was a, it was a genius move. So this is what it sounds like. VIP. Let's kick it. I think that sounds better. <laughs> Lots of people agree with me, including some of you guys. Um, yeah, so, so this is, that is a perfectly enjoyable song, if not better, but it is very different from this, right? So that would say that, that's one control that would say that bass line is really important to the experience of this song. And we can also take it completely out that's the other extreme, right? Like it should be, it should detract from the listening experience. And this is what it sounds like. It sounds kind of terrible. VIP. All right, so Let's you're listening it. to a studio version. So, so those are the four, and we have an analogous set for blur lines. And then you can also com uh, compare it to a completely different song in the same genre. Right? And that should be even more different because it has no elements that's in common. So once you have that set, so if it looks something like this, then I think it's, at least intuitively, it is similar because of this, and it's important because of three and four. Right? Now, suppose it happened, it, suppose we got something like this. Right? So if everything were like crammed together, which we think will be probably the case with, uh, or maybe the case with blur lines, it would be similar, but it's not very important. Uh, this would be like if you took some really minor things and you, you know, changed it, right? Like everything would basically be the same, but uh, it, because it doesn't add to the experience of the song. And, uh, and, and important but not similar is probably much easier. Now one and two are gonna be really far apart. So you're not even similar in the first place. So even if it's important, you're not copyright infringing because you know these are just fundamentally different uh, elements, right? So that's it. Uh, so we have, we, we finally, actually, actually like a couple of weeks ago, we have all the stimuli. Um, it took much longer than we thought. Um, it, it's, it's kind of amazing, and it also taught me how little I know about music and how terrible my ear is. Um, so I hope to be able to tell you this uh, answer in the near future because we're literally running that study right now. Um, and uh, yeah, and that, that's it. So, so just to conclude, um, hopefully I think one thing is uh, that uh, it, one takeaway for uh, uh, this uh, talk is that consumer mindsets are important in a lot more ways than one might appreciate. Uh, even, you know, I have been teaching this, uh, teaching marketing for 10 years, and, you know, so I never thought about uh, uh, problems dealing with you know, law and copyright. Uh, but by looking to the brain, we can both improve trust in the tools that people are using right now, um, and, and and I don't think we're necessarily looking to re uh, replace 
the existing tools, which is, I think, how people oftentimes talk about it. It's like, oh, you're, you're just going to do, uh, you're just going to replace, like, it's, it's almost like, you know, um, MP3s, like, replacing CDs, right? Like, I don't think it's going to operate like that because each of the tools, you know, there's a reason why you take a marketing research class, a marketing analytics class. There's a whole bag of tools that you go through because each one of them have some strengths and weaknesses. So this addresses some fundamental flaws or issues uh, and weaknesses with the stand, uh, with the existing tools, um, and by by but by combining them, we can really start generating new insights that's not possible before. And in terms of future directions, one thing we're working really hard to is reducing the cost of the methods and in increasing the scale because it's still kind of a very expensive, all these tools are pretty expensive, right? Like they're mostly for the most part, they're developed for clinical uses where the standards are very different. So for example, we're trying to use natural language processing tools to build models of consumer memory. So we don't have to like scan or survey people um, uh, to, get their, uh, to get a sense of what their, um, you know, what, what's uh, in their memory networks. And, uh, and you know, hopefully some of the examples will illustrate, like we're trying to translate these science that are kind of like you know, kind of working models um, into managerial practice and also you know, policy uh, to inform policy. And so, yeah, so, I mean, that, that's, I think that's it. Um, thank you all for your attention.